not clearly informed with the Word of God, it's very interest, it's very possible to accept tradition rather than truth. Jesus says in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Why is it during this lecture series that we put texts on the screen? Because we want you to see them. Some of you are taking notes. Some of you are going home and studying these notes. Why is it that we have the search for certainty Bible course in the back? That you can go back every single night and get a Bible lesson and study those lessons. It's because I do not want you to depend on me. If all you get out of this lecture series is, you know that Mark Finley is a halfway decent lecturer. You know, he's not too bad after all. You know, and if all you get out of this is those are fine lectures. What I want to do is so stimulate your mind that you anchor it in the Word of God. Amen. Because somebody's going to come along that is far more persuasive than I am, far more eloquent than I am, far more brilliant than I am. That's not too difficult. Far more brilliant than I am. They're going to come along someday. And if you do not have your mind anchored in the Word of God, you will fall for that deception. But the Bible says, read it with me please, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. I have seen the simplest people in the world, some of them. I mean, I've been preaching way back in the jungles with illiterate people. They grasp the word of God, and they cannot be moved from their faith. It is not the brilliance of your mind. It's the attitude of your heart. Amen. And it's filling that mind with the living word of God. We're in Moscow's Olympic Stadium. I told you some about that. Billy Graham preached there four days, and I was gifted to come in after that to stay in the Olympic Stadium for a month. At 18,000 people coming out to our meetings, and uh, I was like the opening night of the meetings, and we had led to Christ many KGB agents and many, uh, many uh, Russian soldiers. And as as the first night, I came out to preach, and people were coming up, these women, and they were giving us flowers because we had been in the Kremlin preaching at Bonn University, and they're giving us flowers, and I'm giving them to the ushers, you know. It was just wonderful. A lady comes up, and I should have known the flowers were wilted. And I went to reach out, and she pulled the microphone out of my hand. She said, it's the first night, 18,000 people. She said, this man is the Antichrist. Attack him. <laughs> and so... Who was this woman? She wasn't dressed like this, but this is who she was. Mary David Christ. Mary, because she believed she was the mother of God. Christ, and she believed she was pregnant with the new Christ child, and that he would be David that would rule this earth. She believed and taught her followers this total unbiblical idea that it was the good angels that were cast out of heaven, not the bad ones, the good ones. The Bible says the bad ones. And she, they were called the white knights. She had 18 to 22,000 followers. She eventually was in prison, but anyway, not because they attacked me. But, so she had these 18,000 followers, and so she brings the white knights there. She yells attack. These white knights jump out of the audience. They rush onto the platform, and they begin attacking me. You know, it wasn't, I was dodging a little bit, but it was not the easiest thing I've ever been through. So anyway, but the KGB officers and the Russian army that I had baptized, many of them now come to Christ, they didn't forget their skills. And so when they saw their own preacher being attacked, they knew exactly what to do. Um, so they took care of it pretty good. But then we had to ring the stage because for 12 nights in a row I got attacked. 12 nights in a row. I mean, those people, they caused some rumpus up in the balcony, and then when the, when the, when the ushers went up there to handle it, they'd crawl down the aisle and jump on the stage, you know, and try to... We had a baptism by immersion. They broke glass and put it in the bottom of our baptismal pool so people would cut their feet, you know, and they burned down our signs, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But here's the point. What should her followers have known? She said, look, we are going to establish a utopia on earth. Now, this is a bizarre, extreme example. But there's a million other examples that people are falling for. This idea there's going to be an age of Aquarius. This idea that, that there's a, a, a new enlightenment that's coming, some, some enlightenment. Look, Jesus put it this way. The simple truth of God's word dispels error. What does Jesus say? John 14, verse 3 says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. 
that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is not coming to establish some nirvana, some new age on earth. He's coming to take us where he is. Amen. Notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. You see, knowing the word of God protects you from a million errors. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. This is not Aquarius. This is not some new age movement. This is not some cosmic master. This is Jesus Christ descending from heaven. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. This is the glorious climax of human history, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall do what? Rise, Rise first. Rise. Only Jesus can stream down the current of the sky. Amen. Only Jesus can illuminate the heavens in the glory of God with 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Only Jesus can announce through the voice of the archangel that earth has come now to an end and that there's a new society and only Jesus can raise the dead. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? The meet the Lord where? In the air. What if, what if there was a being of dazzling brightness? What if there was a cosmic master? What if he were in the national stadium? What if thousands were coming to be healed of so-called cancer? What if he said, that I'll heal the diseases. I'll bring all nations together. What if there was economic collapse in the world? What if natural disasters ripped our world apart? What if we we're on the verge of, 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 of war? And what if a cosmic master appeared? Would you go there? If you know the Bible, you would not. Because the Bible says that we will be caught up to meet Christ where? In the air. And it says when Jesus comes, he'll resurrect the dead. Yeah. Understanding these truths of the Bible do, will deliver us from a million heresies at the end. When Jesus comes, the graves are open. Only Christ, who was resurrected from the tomb, can give us life again. If any religious leader distorts the gospel, if any religious leader discards biblical principles, if any religious leader downplays God's law and says obedience is unnecessary, beware. Because God leads us back to his word. Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony. That is to the law of God and to the testimony of scripture. If they do not speak according to this word, there's no light in them. Now notice what it does not say. It does not say there's new, no truth in them. Why not? Because the devil mingles truth and error. What if you had a vegetable soup and you looked at your vegetable soup and there was only one teaspoon of arsenic in it, would you eat it? No. Look at all those vegetables in there. I know my pastor preaches a little error, but I get a lot of vegetables. I better not go there, right? I know my church doesn't teach all the truth, but, uh, but you know, pastor, I don't want any vegetable soup with one teaspoon of arsenic, do you? No. To the law and to the testimony. Now notice what it does not say. If they do not speak according to it, it's because it doesn't say there's no truth there. Neither does it say there's no love there. See, many people say, oh, pastor, I just love my church because it's so loving. <laughs> what does the scripture say? There is no what? Light there. Why does the Bible precisely use that word light? Because light is what you follow. Light is what you follow. There may be some power, so-called power. There may be some warm fuzzies, so-called love. There may be some truth mingled with error, but if they do not lead you to know Christ and be obedient to Christ's law and to follow the testimony of Scripture, there is, no, there is what there, folk? No, no light. Why light? Because light's what you follow, and God wants you to follow his word. You know, these cults are rising up all the time. This is the most popular cult in South America, and in inter-America, millions follow it. It's pretty obvious on the website, his website is said, I am Jesus Christ the man. Millions are following this guy. Millions are following him. I gotta get this off because I don't want you to look up his website. All right. Here's the point. Cults number one, substitute a human leader for divine. Cults number two, substitute human teachings for the word of God. Cults number three, manipulate minds. They coerce members into submission. Jesus, gives us the power of choice. 
Now, these cults that are manipulating minds today are preparing for Revelation's final cult. Look what it says in Revelation 17, verse 13. These are of one mind. In other words, they cannot think for themselves. They have group think. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Now, that we're going to study later about the beast power of Revelation 13, but what I want you to see tonight is this. What is it that will lead multitudes and millions to ultimately take the mark of the beast? It is that they will not make a moral, spiritual, ethical choice to step out and follow Christ when it's difficult to do that, and it means being different from society around them. So they allow others to squeeze them into their mold. It's like the person who comes to my meetings and says, well, Pastor Mark, I, I know that the Sabbath is true, but, but you know, Pastor Mark, nobody else very much does this, and my whole church doesn't do this, and I've done that all my life. In other words, when I get into this kind of group think business, when I allow the traditions of my past to mold my thinking process so I can't make a decision when I see truth, 